panelists, and my first question is whether it will work, it will start work, start, start to up today or not. So the question of prediction of volcanoes, the prediction of volcanic hazard, the prediction of the effect on the climate is the very important uh, question which should be solved and which could be solved. And in order to do this, we often make models, mathematical models, physical models. And I did modeling for uh, 10 years. And one, once upon a time, I have found myself in front of a system of 13 differential equations. And I figured out that something is wrong here. Many parameters, many equations, they're beautiful. They are complicated. I was very proud to show them on, the, on my on slides, so everyone will see that this guy, guy is really smart. He can figure out how, wh what's there. But I was not satisfied at all, because I saw that uh, I'm losing the main direction by modeling. And that's happen it, it happens with many, many modelers in many, many different uh, parts of science. And the answer uh, could be found in the uh, in the way how first airplanes were built and, ship and ships built in hydrodynamics and aerospace dynamics, the answer was found quite f long ago. It is the similarity, th similarity theory, which could uh, gather a lot of details into few main points and then show the picture in general. And it is done somewhere. It is done in... Uh, energetics, it is done in aerospace, but it is almost never done in geological science, unfortunately. So first what I want to start is actually uh, uh, this presentation uh, is about, about volcanoes, which are beautiful, which, which are interesting, which are some, somehow uh, uh, intriguing, but uh, for specialists, we, uh, as specialists in, in volcanics, in volcanology, we always think that we do know our object. And when we talk about different types of eruptions, we always call this them somehow Strombolian eruption or Plinian, subplinian eruption, in order to tell that what we really observe in, in our, uh, on our volcano. And then the same question is in, in our model. For example, if I want to predict the eruption of certain volcano of certain type of volcano and certain type of eruption, I would like to tell to my colleagues that I'm doing something about Strombolian eruption. And then the first question for me as mathematician and physician is, what, what, what is a Strombolian type of eruption? It's just beautiful fountaining, which we observe on, on our field work, or we can uh, characterize it by some uh, quantities. And whether, in general, whether it is possible to make the separation, qualitative separation of different eruption types based on quantities. And of course it was done. It was done before, but mainly in terms of uh, high flow rate, low flow rate, how high, how low, what is the number, how can I, uh, being on the volcano or being after the eruption or even uh, uh, looking on the outcrop, how can I characterize the eruption uh, based on the qualities which could be measured. And of course, modeling. Modeling which is uh, really needed for prediction. Prediction of hazard, prediction of the eruption uh, event. Whether we do model what we uh, think we do model. For example, in many books, the volcanic eruption is uh, said that it is something like a champagne bottle. And the mechanism of uh, this uh, form appearing the bubbles and gas lifting in the champagne uh, bottle uh, could explain us what happens in volcano. But that's it. That's all that we get from, from these books. Whether really champagne bottle does something to do with, with volcanoes in terms of uh, flow regimes, in terms of flow rates, viscosities, and so on. As a, as a physicist, I'm, I'm not satisfied by such sort of comparisons. And the same comparisons is done, unfortunately, is done in very serious scientific works uh, where people attempt to make real uh, modeling. And if I made a model, my 13 e differential equations, I love them, I know them, but this is a volcano, huge and, and beautiful, and this is my equations. Uh, whether we 
uh, are talking about the same thing. And is it possible to, to verify the model if I do not have any accurate parameters? For example, this type of eruption. It's a beautiful eruption. It was uh, not, not long ago, two years ago. And we could really approach the volcano. We could measure viscosities. We could measure the flow rates. And it is good. But what happens like the subplinian eruptions, which also happens. It's year 2007. And we cannot tell what happens in, in, in this cloud of ash and, 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 and bombs. And we can only try to estimate or to guess what happens there. But we need to have quantities. We, we need to have the numbers in order to make our model uh, real. So this is the very important question, whether we need to model at all, because we cannot measure. Uh, so why, why modeling? And of course, volcano is complicated. The climate system is very complicated. We have many, many different parameters in several orders of, of, of uh, value. And we cannot measure them accurately. So why do we need, how, how we are so brave to make models at all? But we need them. We need to make something on our table to see what will happen on the huge volcano uh, if, if it will work as we think it will work. So this is our, this is our job. This is what, we'd be, what we will be asked. Why didn't you predict the eruption? So we have to build our models. And uh, for specialists in, in volcanology, I always ask, what, OK, we have a bunch of papers all over the globe for, which uh, deal with different models. When did you use the model the last time? When did you really took the modeled numbers uh, and uh, compare it to a real volcano? And usually the answer is that, of course, it is interesting. And of course, it, it, we can understand something uh, using our models. But volcanoes are much more complicated. So we have to deal with each volcano separately, and so on. So these, these words made me really sad. And uh, let's see how usually models are built. What, what is the, the problem? So we can build the system of equations. Or we can build very beautiful uh, experimental setup. Then we put some parameters, initial conditions, boundary conditions, into these models, and we get some results. Usually, it's something that we need. Rates, velocities, maybe regime, dynamic features. But we do not know the input correctly. We really do not know whether our input corresponds to volcano. And so, as the result, we've got something, well, 42. 42, is it, is it big? Is it, is it, is it small? It is quite precise, maybe 42.5. So I've got the number from the model. But what does it mean, really? What does it mean according to this huge, huge and, and dangerous mountain? And uh, when I've got my results, precise, beautiful charts, uh, I was really uh, disappointed because I found that if I change something, my charts will change. And, and uh, so, so what? I cannot predict the volcano. I can predict my model. So I'm modeling the model not volcano. It, of course, it is bad. And it's usual problem not only for volcanology, not only for me. It is quite usual problem because if you have a linear model with, for example, five parameters only, uh, you need to take two points for each parameter to see how does the model um, uh, change, not that how the, the behavior will change. And it means about 30 experiments to see the linear, the linear model, to see the gradients. If it is nonlinear, well, then we'd have to take more points, not two, maybe three or five. And it means many, many, many experiments uh, which are not interesting. And the answer is already is given. For example, this is the uh, floor, the floor of fluid uh, behind the small bowl. It is about six millimeters in size. And this is the floor behind the um, Aleutic Islands with his, the same pattern. And this is the flow uh, on the, in the Jupiter atmosphere, uh, corresponding, uh, compared with, with the scale of our planet. We see the same patterns, which are called the Karman uh, route. And uh, it is well known that these very different systems, small ball, big island, huge planet, uh, gives us the same flow regime, which could be described by one number, Reynolds number, the similarity criterion. I do know anything, everything about my ball. 
I know how big is it, what fluid is in there, what velocities are, and I can calculate the Reynolds number. It will, it will be, for example, 136. I do know something about my islands and I can estimate the Reynolds number for them. I do not know anything about the Jupiter. It is far away, and I, don't, I really don't know what happens there, what is the density of atmosphere, what, is, what are the velocities, but looking out on the, at, at the pattern, I really can say that the Reynolds number will be between 20 and 200. Quite sure in it. And it is simple, and it is, it is really good. It is known for, for 100 years, 150 years, and it is, uh, it, it is used in, in technology, but it is not used widely in fundamental um, physics. And even in, in, even in, in physics, uh, it, it is not always uh, used properly. Another, another example. This is a Strombolian eruption of Klutschewskoy volcano, Kamchatka, and Mount Etna uh, here in, in Italy. And in the middle, this is the eruption of our uh, experimental setup, which uh, was built to model the, the eruption process. Of course, we are not interested in the fountain itself. It is not so interesting. But we can see that the pattern of uh, flow of these bombs is really similar. And there is a number, which is called fruit number, which describes the movement of a body within the gravity. It's very simple, and I'm quite sure that for all th these three systems, which are very different in scale, one at a big volcano, another is small pipe, I'll have the same fruit number, and then I'll have the same, the same um, uh, behavior. And the main point, if my model does not show this correspondence, I need to change model. I cannot change the nature, but I can change the model. Not because I want to make it more complicated, just because it is really necess necessary. Because if this, this uh, proportion between speed, uh, acceleration, and length will change in my real model, and it is not uh, changed in, in real system, then I have to do something with my model. So, uh, in, in brief, we have, usually we deal with dimensional parameters, which depends on units. For example, viscosity. If I measure it in C system, it will be about 8.9. Uh, and uh, then exponent minus four pascal per second. If I use uh, another units, I'll have different number. It, it doesn't mean that the viscosity changed, the number has changed, and units have changed, but it doesn't change the, the, the physics. If I use the complexes which do not have dimension, then I do not need any, uh, any units at all. For example, a Reynolds number, fruit number, and so on, they do not have units. Uh, I can measure everything in units which are more uh, adequate for, them, for the system or for the tradition, it doesn't matter. And what I suggest is to use not only traditional dimensional complexes, but to create the system of dimensionals, dimensionless complexes for each system in quite formal and uniform way, not to use traditional uh, complexes. I do not need to use Reynolds and Fruit or Euler uh, numbers in volcanology because they didn't fit volcanology. They fit something in uh, well, different systems. They fit everything, but they were constructed to describe pipes, for example, or the, air, uh, the, the wing of the airplane, but not volcano. So the formal parameter is something that I introduce, is a dimensionless complexes, but which is proportional to some exact dimensional parameter which uh, reflects its behavior. For example, I can take the Reynolds number and put it upside down. Uh, you see? If, is it? Yeah. So this is traditional Reynolds number and it has viscosity somewhere uh, in, in the cellar. And if I just turn it upside down, I'll have the dimensionless complexes which is proportional to viscosity. If I make it bigger twice, my uh, criteria will be twice bigger. It is easy. It is more convenient because Reynolds number will change in different direction. Of course, it's a matter of some could say it is a matter of uh, tradition. But when we use it in the equations, it will it will be um, much much more uh, sense in it. And for example, fruit number, 
which does reflect the uh, acceleration rate uh, and uh, velocity. If I just make, uh, reorganize it, just make another uh, power, it will be proportional to velocity. So it will be the formalized velocity. This is very easy, it is, it is simple, it is not, not the invention. I do not uh, say that it's something new. But what I do really make new, uh, I suggest the method of uh, creating the systems of such parameters in formal way uh, according to the system which we are going to model. And of course I'll apply it to volcanology first. So the main framework is I have dimensional parameters, many of them. I move to formal parameters using uh, quite simple linear algebra and uh, quite, quite uh, uh, straightforward approach. And from equations, I get equations which are formalized in, in terms of these formal par parameters. And what is the difference? Uh, this is the equation, for example, of the f liquid flow, quite simple. This is the same equation, but uh, in terms of traditional uh, criteria, of similarity criteria. And some, some of them do reflect uh, the, the effect of this term, some of them not. For example, this term uh, it deals with pressure. What does pressure affect, how, how does it affect the, the, the flow? And uh, we have the Euler number which does the same. If I make the pressure bigger twice, Euler number will be twice bigger and all this term will be twice bigger. It is convenient. So we can say that this is the formalized pressure. If I talk about the gravity, here I have something something weird. I have the fruit number which work up upside down. Same to Reynolds number. So if I make viscosity effect bigger, this number will become smaller. Uh, but I would like to make uh, the equation simple in order to be able to show it to a geologist or geophysicist, not, not physicist, not mathematician. I say that the bigger is this number, the bigger it is this term, this term. And the same for this, the same, the same for this. Again, this is quite simple, but unfortunately it is not so, not so common. We have dimensional parameters which are linked to standards, to some king's foot or to some standard in, in, in Paris. And uh, we have different relative uh, values of these dimensional parameters. And in, in order to get accurate model, we have to accurately measure them. And there, is, there, there are many, there are plenty of, of such uh, numbers. So we have to have many experiments and many diagrams which with, with not so much information in them. If I go to dimensional criteria, to formal parameters, I can, I can uh, link myself to the phenomenon without scale at all. If I have eruption in huge volcano and eruption on my table, it will be the same eruption. I'll, I, I'll be quite sure in it. And the value defines the behavior of the system, and this value could be estimated according to the behavior. So while, while I'm looking at the spectacular eruption, I can estimate numbers, the, crit the criteria of uh, what, what happens in this eruption, whether it is Plinian, whether it is uh, Strombolian, Subplinian, it doesn't matter actually, because looking at the behavior, I can estimate what, is, what are my numbers, and then come to my laboratory and to apply these numbers to my model. And it's not so big. The number of these uh, parameters is not so big. And there is a, a famous uh, P th th theorem which shows that we always can decrease the number of parameters. So we have not so much experiments needed to, to, done, to do. And uh, for us, for volcanologists, the two-phase flow is the uh, main model which we use to see what happens inside the volcano, not outside, but inside. We have the chamber, we have the conduit, we have gas bubbles and then this molten uh, magma and then lava. So we use uh, the two-phase or three-phase flow diagrams. And it's strange enough that we have well-known Baker's plot which shows what kind of flow you have with different flow rates uh, of gas and, and rate of, of the liquid. And it was done quite long ago. And it is used uh, in uh, electric power uh, plants, in submarine power plants, wherever. But it is done in dimensional charts. And uh, uh, there was a guy, Martin Van Jacht, well, not was, he, he's alive, thank of God. And uh, he 
made the same chart, but in, dim in dimensionless numbers, in 1975. And in year 2010, he claimed that, unfortunately, no one uses my diagram, uh, uh, unless I tell to do it. So there's a tradition not to use the dimensionless uh, criteria, even though everyone knows that uh, they are much better. So we have to, to, to show, even to, our, to specialists, to show why it is good. Why, we, why it is uh, really important. And what I want to have is something like this, a chart which can show us where we will have different eruptions, different type of eruptions, and what, what numbers they will correspond. Again, this, you see, we have measures here. Well, percent is not, they, that doesn't have any dimension, but here we have the square meters, the area of the ash deposits. So it is the good, attempt to make the map of regimes of volcano. But again, it is related to dimensional quantities. I would like to do something which will allow me to do something on the table without square kilometers. I cannot do any square kilometers on my table. And in volcanology, of course, people do uh, use these numbers, but without any system. Different years, different uh, uh, scientists and different criteria. And there is no uniform system. And there is no system which exactly fits our problem, volcanology. And there is no regime maps, unfortunately. For uh, maybe half an cent of a century of modeling of eruption, we still do not have a real regime map for volcanoes. So let's try to build it right now. Uh, I will try to be quite mm, uh, short in this example. So let's take small, small example, small model of volcano, which we have the, the conduit with pressure difference, which uh, causes the eruption. So we have the driving force, which is just pressure. We have the inertia, because the uh, magma is dense. We have gravity, and we have viscosity. Four, four main forces. And we have physical parameters, which describe these uh, four forces. Seven, quite big. So seven different uh, parameters which I can change and everything will change with them. And I can build some traditional complexes without dimension uh, from these forces, which are quite straightforward. Pressure, inertia, gravity inertia, and viscosity inertia. Beautiful. That's what uh, hydrodynamics does. Uh, but my uh, approach is a bit different. So we have set of dimensional parameters. We have set of basic dimensions. And we can uh, build formal parameters from these dimensional parameters uh, in uh, such a way that these two parameters we will exactly uh, correspond to certain quantities which we can measure being on the volcano. I cannot measure the velocity. I cannot measure the viscosity. It will depend on, 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 on uh, gas, uh, on uh, the um, temperature, whatever. So I do not need Reynolds number. I, I cannot use it, unfortunately. So I would like to formalize formalized, uh, the flow rate, which could be estimated after the eruption. I fly around on the helicopter and I see how much lava have been erupted for, a, for example, a day or two days. So I have this flow rate. And I can formalize the viscosity because it depends strongly on the uh, content of lava, which could be, again, picked and measured, and on, on the temperature, which could be measured right, right uh, along the eruption. So this is my choice. And I can build quite complicated, quite uh, weird parameters, which uh, are formalized viscosity and formalized flow rate. And then I can see whether this choice of this criteria is the best. Uh, I can make several combinations of them, which still be dimensional complexes, but they could be, big, uh, 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 they could be more or less suitable for modeling. For example, I, I have introduced two uh, measurements of formal parameter spaces, which is divergency, which shows whether we can uh, separate different regimes clearly, and orthogonality, which shows whether different parameters do not disturb each other uh, in our complexes. And for example, for this 
complexes, we have very good orthogonality. It is good. The, the more is the, big, uh, the better. And quite good divergency. For uh, formally built system, we have the same divergency, which shows that different regimes will be uh, clearly separated, but uh, not so good orthogonality. And the classical Reynolds and Froude number, uh, unfortunately, give more poor divergency and uh, awful orthogonality. And then a bit later, I'll show what, what does it mean in terms of the regime map. Now, having, having these formal parameters in hand, I can take uh, typical behavior of volcanoes. For example, basaltic volcanoes and uh, andesite volcanoes. Typical numbers uh, for density, viscosity, and, and, and so on. And I can show, in space of these parameters, where could be the eruptions of basaltic volcanoes, like Hawaiian, uh, Etna, uh, Erebus, Khrushchevskoy, where I can uh, find uh, andesite volcanoes exploding, like Pinatubo uh, or Mayon, or where they will just grow the lava domes. On one chart, I can show all, well, all variety of uh, volcanic uh, behavior. And then I take, as, as an example, a few typical eruptions of, of uh, exact volcanoes. Uh, from the literature, from uh, the field works, I can estimate certain um, numbers for viscosity and uh, flow rate and the size of volcano, being sure that I'm not trying to find the exact numbers. It is impossible to matter them, but I can have a range. And then I can show where on my chart will be these different volcanoes. Kilauea, Krychevskoy volcano, Tolbachinsky volcano, Mount Erebus, basaltic volcanoes. They, uh, put, they are located in different parts of this map. And I can easily uh, show that somewhere here, in terms of my parameters, I will have effusive and, and fountaining uh, regime. Well, it could be Strombolian regime. It could be Hawaiian type of regime. Somewhere here, Strombolian and Vulcanian, so we can have an explosions. We can have the uh, ash clouds. Here we'll have clearly Vulcanian. And you see this Vulcanian eruption is close to andesite explosive eruption, which is good. They have different s scale. Uh, explosive andesite volcanoes like Pinatubo or Mayon or Bezanian volcano, they really have, give huge explosions. But the same mechanism could be observed in a quite you know, calm volcanoes like Luchevskoy or Karimsky and so on. So that's what, what I really want to do. I have to find this map precisely. And act actually, this is what is done. Finally, we have a map where we can point what is the Strombolian eruption, what is the Volcanian. But it is not the goal. It is just a side, uh, side goal. The goal is to take the experimental setup, which, for example, is built in our institute. It is very good. It is really a uh, um, brilliant uh, experiment which gives our insight into how does Volcano really work. And to, sh to see where, which volcanoes really we can model uh, by this equipment. And if we use only water, then we can model only volcanoes like Kilauea and Kruchevskoy a bit. But if we use, for example, glass roll, then our band will be much wider. And if we use different pipes, then we can uh, even more widen the area of modeled uh, volcanoes. And then we are sure that we really do model our volcano. More, um, oops, sorry. The more old uh, setup, which was done in, in 80s and 90s uh, in Italy, they did very good work of modeling the uh, eruption of Mount Etna. And here we are. This is the area where this uh, setup could be used. And we are really sure that this setup really does model the, the, equation, the, the eruption. But we are we also we are sure that we do not need to expect the behavior of Vulcanian, volcanic type in this setup. It, it, it couldn't fit. So we have to build something different to, to model volcanic, uh, Vulcanian eruptions. Or, uh, for example, uh, the existence of persistent lava lake, like in Mount Erebus. So this setup has this area of, uh, of, um, of uh, the model. And the Champagne model, which is uh, shown in, in many textbooks, here it is. 
Kilauea uh, volcano in Hawa Hawaiian volcano, and it's some, somewhere there. So this is the Champagne, and this is Kilauea. So we we'll really see that, yeah, probably our model, when we say that Champagne bottle does uh, give us the insight of volcano process, probably yes, but not all processes, only quite narrow uh, field. But it is important important to see this field and to compare this field. And that's uh, w w what I talk about, the divergency and orthogonality. This is uh, the chart which is built in uh, formal parameters, which were found by formal procedure. I didn't do it by hands. Uh, I, it, this procedure is formal enough to be done by computer, for example. And it gives me quite good result. And this, this is quite typical uh, Reynolds and fruit number. And we see that the same chart looks much worse. It doesn't fit volcanology. They are good enough for, for their field, but they do not fit volcanology. And if I rearrange these parameters even better to have the orthogonality one, then I have much more clear chart which could, make, could, could give me more uh, detailed map in future. And if I add, if I add uh, one more parameter is the uh, gas content, then I can separate anthesite and basaltic equations even more clearly. So it means that I can add more effects and have uh, still uh, have clear maps without a uh, bunch of several charts, several maps, several uh, more and more experiments. Everything becomes much more simple and it still uh, allows us to see where we are moving. So thank you very much. This is what I wanted to, uh, to show you. Questions, please. Thanks for this wonderful lecture. Uh, the pattern you have showed to us about that bullet and that pattern of flow, I believe this is only for a turbulent flow with a very high speed flow. You see, but in any volcano, with time and with depth, the velocity is changing. So you don't have a unique pattern in all the volcano through its depth and through its time of eruption. See what I mean? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, secondly, you said, you know that viscosity is proportional to temperature. And temperature is a function of the depth. Okay, so right. you don't have a unique mm -hmm. viscosity, so you cannot use exactly. single number you know, for uh, your model. That's right. That's the point which which I'm started. I do not know really. I can uh, model what happens in the conduit. How does pressure change? How does viscosity change? Mm -hmm. But what I really have in my field work is the vent. The only, the only thing that I have is the surface, nothing else. Oh, okay. So okay. by introducing these formal things, I get rid of unknown parameters in depth. I don't need them because I cannot measure them at all. You're right, clearly. Uh, that's why I did this work. I'm not trying to model exact process because it's impossible to verify. One more thing. Yes. Have you tried to correlate between the location of the volcano and any type of your models? I location? mean that, for example, if your volcano is in the ocean, is it the same as the other one in the land? Of it's course supposed not. to be not. Of course not. Oh, yeah. and, and why, again, why you don't take the location you see, was, as a parameter? Uh, not, in your uh, you see, there was no uh, uh, undersea eruptions because uh -huh. these uh, phreatic uh, regime of uh, eruption is different from, uh, well, let's say, the on Earth, the, the dry, dry uh, volcanoes. But if we want to introduce the seawater inside, we have to add more and more parameters again. So I'm afraid that uh, undersea eruptions will be on the different chart because we have uh, really different processes. But it is possible to build it, and it is possible then to compare the models of undersea eruptions again. Finally, what is the purpose? that you put you, the, the volcanoes in number of models. What is your purpose to do so? 
balance Why? of number? Why you are doing this type of classification? It's a type of classification. Classification is not the, the matter. I don't need classification. In, but, in, but you put, you put yeah, that... It's, it's actually it's, something no. that uh, we uh, solve, by the way. The main idea is to be able to verify the model. If someone in his paper, or me, for example, says that I do model the Aetna, I would be really sure that I do model the Aetna, not model my tubes, not model my, my, my uh, jar with, with water and, and bubbles. And I, it's not about classification. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting uh, talking. But uh, I would like to explain the climatic change during the Cretaceous Paleocene boundary. You know, the climatic is very warm as these episodes. You know, it may be uh, fossil energy. Can you guess the your volcano can affecting on the Paleocene warming also? Did you guess this? I'm sorry, could you repeat yeah. your question, please? I can, I can, I can explain. Yes. You, you know, the climatic change during the Cretaceous Paleocene boundary, mm -hmm. there is some warming at this episodes. The same happened between Paleocene and Eocene boundary. Mm -hmm. The climatic change was warming. Mm -hmm. Did you guess the vol your volcanoes is affecting in this period and they can name it as energy fossils? Ah, you mean the interaction of volcanic process and, and climate change? Yeah. That's your question. Yeah. Oh, uh, of course it is. And uh, by all means it must be so. But uh, the climate is uh, very nonlinear and very complicated system, uh, same as volcanoes are. So if we have small eruption, we'll have one kind of effect. A big eruption will make something like cooling, small eruptions or persistent eruption will uh, produce a lot of uh, CO2 and, and uh, sulfur dioxide and the effect will be different. But uh, as far as we know, uh, by studying the uh, ice bores in, in uh, Greenland and in uh, Antarctic, we can see that the climate change and volcanic uh, activity correlate uh, quite Closely. Actually, this is unfortunately this is not my specialty. So even though this conference is about the climate change, I'm not uh, quite good in this question. But as far as uh, I know, uh, even moderate eruptions make quite uh, viewable effect on local climate. We do see it uh, each year in Kamchatka. Uh, we see how how volcanoes change the time when spring comes to, to, to Kamchatka. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try to speak without the microphone, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Sergei. Brilliant presentation. And uh, it makes, I don't know anything about volcanology, but after listening to your presentation, I feel that I can tomorrow give a lecture. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. So the first question, actually what do I really have is not only just combinational ratio of viscosity to gravity. It, is, it doesn't make sense, you're right, well, direct sense. 
It is uh, the teaspoon of one and a handful of another, some combination, which by itself doesn't have the sense of ratio of one force to another force. It's something to something because it is dimensionless. But uh, why I have exact this recipe of preparing such sort of, uh, of, of a combination is to be able uh, to see in, in, for example, three-dimensional space, I have these areas, and I have the shadow of these areas, and I have to turn this three-dimensional picture in order to have the, the clearest shadow. And it won't be a ratio of forces. It will be something that makes, well, sense in order to see the shadow. That's why I uh, suggest mm, something new to well-known area. But uh, it, is, it is not a um, matter of art. It is formal procedure, and that's, that's why it is uh, useful. Uh, we can apply it in, in anywhere. And as for the second part of your question, the prediction is uh, the main point. And you're right, it is uh, quite painful question. We know how to predict some volcanoes, and we do have good predictions uh, yet, and we are proud of them. But we still have uh, volcanoes uh, which are very and very strange, and they do not uh, allow us to predict, unfortunately. And that's, that's why we build models. Because just by listening, uh, using uh, seismometry or geodesy, just by listening, we are not able to predict anything. We have to see what do we listen to, what really happens inside. And that's why we build models equations, setups, whatever. And then the question is the linkage between our model and, uh, and the volcano. Uh, I f few years ago, mm, I reviewed a paper where uh, the authors uh, say that in our setup, they make an experimental setup, in our setup, the uh, magma chamber is uh, 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 located at uh, seven kilometer deep. They are talking about their model, but they say that it is located seven kilometers deep. It means that they have built seven kilometer pit and, and, and made the channel. They model the model, and the confusion between modeling and the, uh, and the real uh, thing, unfortunately, is about it. And they, usually when I see such sort of, of, of comparison, it is all about dimensions, unfortunately. If they say that we have the same fruit number, I would be quite um, adequate. Yeah, that's, it means that they have the same effect. Okay. And of course it is everything about prediction. And prediction not only of eruption itself, but prediction of what kind of eruption we'll have. Because different eruption types, different eruption regimes in one volcano during one er eruption period could have drastical difference in, in, in the hazard and, and effects. So I think I have taken much time. Yeah, thank you very much.